Hello, I'm Kelly Martica, Associate Director of Gift Planning here at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Welcome to the quarter two investor briefing. Thank you for watching and for your partnership with the Foundation for your charitable planning and goals. This presentation will be a little bit different than others. It'll be on demand for your viewing ease. We recently heard from various foundation stakeholders that they're interested in having access to our investor briefings in order to best respond to the pace of market change. As always, if you are looking to update your lifetime giving, grow your fund, are considering legacy giving, or interested in co-investing in the Greater Together campaign, please reach out to your philanthropic advisor or the gift planning team, myself or Morika Klemensky, Director of Gift Planning. Joining me today is my colleague, Emmanuel Rios, our philanthropic advisor for agency endowments and resident swag closet key savior. Um, more than one time, he has opened our swag closet for me because I lock the key inside. Hello, Emmanuel. Um, if you're an agency leader or a member looking to start an endowed fund or want to review and update the ones the foundation already holds, Emmanuel is your guy. Reach out to him and he can help answer any of your questions. Finally, our esteemed guest, as always, is Mike Miller, Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner at Crucial Partners, an independent investment advisory firm providing customized investment advice to nonprofit institutions. Mike has been a valuable partner to the foundation for many years, providing critical guidance and thoughtful investment advice to our investment committee. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Mike. In this briefing, Mike will provide an update on the GMF investment pool, followed by questions from fund holders and stakeholders facilitated by myself and Emmanuel. Thank you again for attending and take it away, Mike. Thank you, Kelly, for that very kind introduction and, and welcome everyone to the investment review. If we could advance the next slide. We'll dive right into some of the good news around investment returns to start this year. So this chart, which is a little confusing looking, but shows you some very important information, which is the investment returns of the corporate portfolio, the GMF Corporation, which is the blue bars, BPI plus the spending rate, which is our long-term objective to preserve the intergenerational balance and purchasing power of these assets. That's the gray bars. The red bars are simple. Let's just mix two market indices, 70% global stocks, 30% bonds. And the green bar is something called the custom market benchmark, which measures the, it's essentially the policy portfolio, which is the asset mix of the portfolio, stock, bonds, private equity, et cetera, using market indexes to represent each piece of the pie. And we use that to help decide and generate um, knowledge around whether or not the management managers we're hiring and the way we construct the portfolios, in fact, is in fact adding value. So one of the things you can see, which is really interesting, is first of all, uh, a quarter ago, there was some very big negative numbers on this page. Those losses are still buried in our returns, of course, but you can see that when you look at the year-to-date period and in the latest three years, we actually have very, very healthy returns. Uh, these returns are, are really, we're very pleased with them. Uh, and you can see that particularly over three years, which is a fascinating time because it represents the post-COVID era. I don't mean COVID's over, but I mean the post the minute that COVID became a big market problem within March of 2020. So the three years uh, that we now have ending March 31st, 2023, essentially is after we knew about COVID, what happened next? It's really interesting to think about that, which is that a time where the world was entering this incredibly complicated place uh, from a business and a personal and every way you could imagine perspective. Um, we stuck to the, the discipline, stayed long term, which was hard to do at the time. And you can see you know, really, really big double digit returns. Which, uh, frankly, I wouldn't have predicted that, which is why it's a good thing that we don't make those kinds of predictions in the portfolio. Uh, and the returns are well above all of our indexes, which we're really pleased about. As you go to five years and seven years and 10 years, you can see the portfolio outperforming its red and green benchmarks slightly to a little bit, um, but not keeping up with that gray bar, which is something that we obviously want to catch up to. When you go out to 20 years, you see something really important, which is the outperformance generated by the corporate portfolio, the GMF portfolio, has been such so significant as it's overcome the odds of actually preserving purchasing power. So most endowments and foundations did not preserve purchasing power over this time period that the foundation actually did and did so with, with a premium as you can see there, which is really useful to go to the next slide and take a look at what happens when you make these numbers compound. So the slide before 
was important because it's basically per year returns over all those periods of time. This graph, believe it or not, is showing you the exact same return with one important difference. Here we're showing you what they look like on a cumulative basis. So that's important because it does two things for us that are really significant. One is it puts our long time horizon in perspective and it explains a lot of our investment strategy. Because at the end of the day, we care a lot about all the returns we generate, but we care more about the ones that are the longer term numbers. Because that's really what this map is here for, is supporting your community over a very long period of time. And what's important is that on the slide before, it kind of makes every time period look like they're the same, when in reality, they're very different from each other. So the long ones matter much, much more. And that's why you can see things like the three-year number, which looks so impressive on the last slide, it still looks good, but it's not look anywhere near as important as, for example, the seven-year, the 10-year, or the 20-year numbers. And this is incredibly significant because when we make decisions, we don't make them for short-term comfort. We make them for long-term success. And when we look at those 20-year numbers, the gap between the foundation's returns, it's a well over 350% cumulatively, and all these other benchmarks is, is really significant. And so that's something we're really pleased about. And the last thing I'd say on this slide is you can see that the green bar, which reflects the investment committee and by extension the board's asset allocation strategy over time, has been really successful. It's generated a premium to a simple 70-30 mix. It's also generated a premium to CPI plus spending. But then we've gone even a step further with the execution of the strategy and had even a higher return, which is that blue bar. And as a reminder, since I didn't mention it before, um, the blue bars are always net of investment management fees. So this is after the investment managers have been paid. So very important that returns are presented that way at all times. So we jump ahead. The other way we think about performance here, even though it's not really an objective per se, but it's certainly a point of interest for us, is how are we doing compared to other endowments and foundations? And in that regard, we look at something called the Invest Metrics Endowment Foundation Universe. It's got about a thousand endowments and foundations from around the country. So it gives us a very good sample of what the rest of the investment community is doing from the endowment foundation world's perspective. When you look at the green bar at the bottom, these are the numbers that you basically saw on the earlier bar uh, for the community foundation. So same time periods. And underneath, underneath that is the median return. So for those who don't think about statistics all day, the median is the middle of the distribution. Half of the endowment foundations did better that number, half did worse than that number. So that's interesting. You can see we're above the median over all the periods of time shown here, which we're happy about. But then it's even better is the top, which is the gray line. And what that gray bar is showing you is how do the foundations rank across quartiles? So now we're being a little more nuanced, which is the top quartile, which is first, means you're in the top 25% of endowments and foundations. The second quartile, which we have one period of year, we are in the second quartile, which means we're above the median or not in the top 25%. Uh, what I'm glad to say you can't see here is anything in the third quartile, which means you're below the median, but not in the bottom, which is the fourth quartile, which is the very bottom. I do want to emphasize something. This picture is almost perfect in the sense that you can see top quartile for every period other than five years. Uh, and for 20 years, that asterisk is a reference to the fact that the 20-year number is in the top 10% of endowments and foundations around the country. So we're obviously very, very proud of that, outperforming more than 90% of the other endowments foundations is, is sort of something that is really important as we showed you earlier, has translated into returns above our long-term objective and CPI plus spending. The other thing I do want to point out here, though, too, is that um, while we don't like it when it happens, you will see third and fourth quartiles come up here for the shorter periods of time. And the reason for that is we're not interested in doing uh, dumb things when the market's doing dumb things. We're going to do smart things. We're not going to be perfect in our timing. So we might be we'll frequently be early. I might have a little bit of short-term embarrassment, but because we're doing things that make sense on a long-term basis, we know that we're, we're always kind of steering the ship, proverbially speaking, to these 7, 10, and 20-year periods you see here, which is what really concerns us the most. Can we turn to the next slide? So <clears throat> the question is usually is, what's the secret sauce? And um, investment people love to make the secret sauce about genius, uh, and no offense to those on the investment committee or others that you'll call out, we'll call out later. Uh, very, very smart, well-meaning people who are really good investors, but genius isn't the word we we bet. We don't principle or base the strategy on genius. Because the problem with genius is it's kind of a rare thing, and we really want something that's not too rare. That gives us a very good chance of continuing to succeed as we have in the past. So three simple rules that do not require you to be very, that you don't require genius. First point, think long-term. That's what gave us that huge return. The last three years you saw before is we didn't have a discussion or debate about going to cash, 
being careful because the world was so scary, we decided to assume a very simple thing, which is that we have time for things to get better. And two, we know that markets are always going to overreact to things, almost whatever they are. They sometimes overreact with too much optimism, like we're seeing today, and sometimes with too much pessimism. Uh, and so we can't get ahead of that, so we don't try to, which leads to the second point, which is we do not change our strategy based on what the market's doing in the short term. Uh, we just can't predict market conditions. We don't try to. So when someone says to me, are you surprised the market's doing this? My answer is always no. I'm never surprised by the markets because I have no expectation for what they'll do or won't do. You can't be surprised when you don't have an expectation in the first place. And last but not least, and this is so important, the foundation's you know, very large asset pool really, really allows us to capitalize on this in a, in a pretty special way, which is we diversify this portfolio. And we'll talk about that a little bit later about the different ways we think about it, but it's incredibly important. And I was, I'm sorry to say for the index um, indices today, diversification is becoming something for more a little less prevalent, and, and it's a really big concern, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we jump to the next slide. This is the strategic mix of the portfolio. The investment committee meets uh, uh, quarterly. They actually met earlier today, and they review this mix, and with an eye towards thinking about um, changing it, uh, and they do it once a year. Also, this is the current mix, which you can see is very long term market. It's 52% in stocks, it's 12% in bonds, and it's 26% and hedge funds, private assets, and mission investments. So it's a really well-balanced mix. It's also one that's oriented to the long-term outcomes that we absolutely must generate uh, so that your capital and those of others, past, present, and future, really are here to continue to do the work that it's done for all these decades. So opportunistic and special situations, just as an explanation of that category isn't familiar to everybody, that's a type of global equity strategy, which tends to involve very concentrated managers. Um, so they're doing things that are very different than indexes, but at the end of the day, they own equities and they're part of our diversification strategy. Generally speaking, the portfolio is kept very close to these targets. We do not have insights into whether the markets will do well or not well in the short term. So we don't move the portfolio in anticipation of something we do not know. We stick to the strategy. It's simple. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel good when you, don't want, when you don't like what's happening in the world, but we know it's the right answer and it's produced the results we saw before. So the next slide is around how we pick managers. So there are three basic rules we use to choose managers. First is we must have a high bar. So we do not retain investment firms that generate small premium, premiums over an index. And while many won't admit it, the way people manage money today for the most part is to do just that. And the reason they don't seek the kind of the glory of great returns is because if you go for the gold, you can flunk out. And people are worried about underperforming much more than they used to be because the indexes have gotten very, very tough to beat. It's short term, but it's still true. Um, and so we, we, but we pass on that. We are not going to pay people a fee to do a little bit better than an index. So we expect the high, we look for high bars. And in English, what that means is two, three, four, five percent per year above an index net of fees. Um, and if we can get that or think we can get that, we will probably invest or maybe invest. We don't always invest with anybody. There must be an edge. Managers must have something they're doing that the rest of the market's not doing. That's actually getting really easy because there's so few fundamental investors left today out there that the edge is almost just doing your job, which is fascinating to think about, which is one of the reasons we're very excited about the future. And we avoid risk of a variety of types. And the ones that are in this group of leverage, risk aversion, which sounds like a weird thing, but that means people get too cautious and destabilizing liquidity structures. That's really a reference to these esoteric things that can come along and just bite you at the worst possible time. And we just have no tolerance for that. We're willing to tolerate the bouncing around when we know that time will, will bail us out, essentially. We are not willing to take on risks that don't give you time. That's what these risks all do. They basically cut the time horizon for it. We go to the next slide. I mentioned before differentiated thinking. I mentioned before diversification. And the word diversity is fascinating, right? Because it's actually the first six letters of that word are the first six letters of the word diversification. And there's a reason for that, which is that investing is about what we call a variant perception. And what variant perception means in this is that I see something or you see something different than, than others do. It might be in a company, it might be in a sector, it might be in a country, it might be anywhere. And the reality is that today in the asset management industry and in the investment industry in general, uh, there's a very it's a very homogenous industry uh, not just by gender and ethnicity, where it is also homogenous, but also by thinking. Uh, there's extremely low level of creative thought going on out there right now. Everybody's rushing into the exact same big U.S. names that, that everyone owns. And to us, 
you know, we, we kind of marvel at it a little bit. We have to sort of feel bad about it because it doesn't make us doesn't make our lives easier. I will admit, but also we feel bad for it because it's gonna it's a precursor to some bad outcomes for other people. So, manager diversity at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation is one of the tools in our toolkit that we use to get to that second bullet point, which is we find talented people, and no surprise anyone on this call, I'm sure, there are talented people by different ages, different locations in the world, different states in the United States, and different and gender and ethnicity. These are all contributors to this idea that we'll find talent across different pools of people and then combine them in a way that maximizes our ability to capitalize on their variant perception. And so diversity, uh, while we are all for a more just and equitable society and an asset management industry that's locally sad on this subject, uh, we would like to see that be different. And it will be different one day, I will tell you. But while we're waiting for it to get better, uh, we'll just take the higher returns being offered to us by pursuing diversity where others are simply not doing it in any kind of a meaningful way. Can we go to the next slide? Oh, this is almost the same slide. I think I might have given you two slides that are very similar. So this is essentially the same slide uh, where we're taking basically the idea that if we combine gender, ethnicity, age, and location, we get essentially a benefit that produces higher returns. That's the critical area of diversity. So now we'll jump ahead. And here is the Greater Milwaukee Foundation's commitment to diversity. So just to note, I mentioned earlier the homogenous nature of the asset management industry. Uh, and that first statistic uh, really tells the story Basically, 0.9% of capital is owned by firms that are led and owned by people of color and women, 0.9%. Uh, unfortunately, while there are lots of people talking about diversity today, there's literally virtually no progress being made. Um, I will say I saw a statistic uh, recently that said that at the current rate of growth of assets in the hands of uh, ethnically diverse people and women, uh, we will reach parity in the asset management industry with the general population in 6,450 years. And yes, that's not a mis I did not misspeak, 6,000 years. So, so things are not going well. But if you look here, the Greater Milwaukee Foundation is a very different approach. Uh, one, it's a very purposeful thing because of what I mentioned earlier. And two, it's something where we are feeling and we are accountable to ourselves, to you, uh, to the community at large. And so what we listed here is something that the investment committee sees every single quarter which is the managers that are diverse in our portfolio. Now we define diversity as described at the bottom, but also I wanna point out that it's majority ownership. So more than 50% ownership is the definition of diversity. Uh, people use different definitions, frequently lower percentages. I hate to be judgmental, but they're wrong. Uh, it has to be more than 50%. That's the only right way to do this. Um, and we have the managers listed when they were hired, uh, what the diversity criteria is, what asset class they invest in. You can see we've got a pretty good spread across asset classes. And we're up to 24.2% of the portfolio and growing in the hands of diverse managers. So I think this is a really great proof statement. And if you want to go back and think about the returns I showed you earlier, these firms and others have contributed to that outcome. And actually, as I mentioned before, she was a fly flying in front of me. These firms and others have contributed to that outcome. And they're the reason that I sleep very well at night knowing that we have a really diverse group of people making decisions in a very complicated climate that we're living today. So we'll jump ahead and talk about this climate. Uh, it is a really tricky one. Um, and frankly, it's one that most people have not seen in a long time. Uh, the good news is we think we have seen it before. Um, and that means it gives us some really interesting opportunities that we believe we can foresee to some degree. But let me talk about the climate. First thing, we do have higher inflation. You didn't need me to tell you that. Uh, if you went back to prior uh, calls, we have mentioned that inflation would come down. And that was pretty obvious. And it's in fact happened. But it's still settling in at pretty high levels, and it's going to come down some more in Italy, hopefully. Uh, but it's not going to go back to the way it was, which is basically no inflation whatsoever. The world has changed, and it's changed in ways that are going to keep some inflation in the system. So what's happened now is because of that, the what we call the free money era, uh, with central banks essentially just pumping tons and tons of money in the system, otherwise known as quantitative easing, for those of you who are technical about these things. But that's all changed. Central banks cannot do that anymore. Uh, they know that they now have a conflict they have to deal with, which is inflation and overvalued equity markets and people who like the free money. Um, so these are very tricky, tricky topics. I'm glad I don't work on the Federal Reserve. I think they have a hard job. But with that said, um, you can see that there's a big misalignment now between investors, specifically high-risk investors and central banks. Well, let me be clear. I mentioned before that we have a lot of equities in this portfolio. So you could describe our strategy as higher risk, maybe. When I refer to high-risk investors, I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to people 
who are essentially investing in things where they really must have cheap capital for them to work. Um, so I won't get specific about who that might be, but I would do this if I were you. If you do a scan of who's complaining the most about the Federal Reserve these days in the investment community or the corporate America community, uh, those are your high-risk people. Basically. The ones who are demanding the most are the ones who are being most hurt by, frankly, more rational policy. And last but not least, as we've seen with the 2023 banking crisis, this is a very complex climate. We have not just a complex climate, but a complex financial and economic system. There are effects that kind of spread in all kinds of ways. And I've been doing this a long time, and I'm still sometimes surprised by how things can be connected to each other. So it's not simple by any means. So we'll jump ahead. So this is really important in that it shows you um, what's happening in the banking system this year. Uh, you didn't need me to tell you this, but there's been a big banking crisis, of course. And this chart is really interesting because what it's showing you is the blue line are the number of bank failures. So you can see that peak in the middle, which is the 2008 to 2010 timeframe. Uh, we had a lot of bank failures, but we don't have that many today. If you look at the lines, barely budged. But now look at the gray bars. Those are the dollars involved in the bank failures that did exist. And that bar to the right is not a typo. Uh, we have now more bank failures by dollar, not by number, than we did in 2008. And almost, I think it might be 2008 and 2009 combined uh, at this point. So this has been a really big deal. It's a sign of what I said earlier, which is when you start to change an economic or a financial or a monetary regime, you have implications. It's not just everything's fine, everything goes back the way it was. And so that's this is a really important thing. It's a very big negative, again, for companies that need free access or cheap access to capital markets. That's all changing. Less bank lending because of this, more expensive loans because of this. These things have real economic implications. And investors need to be thinking about them and thinking about what they're paying in terms of the risks that's for the risks they're taking, which leads to the next slide. And here's the bad news. Um, so a lot of investors understand only half of the equation, which is, is this a good business or a bad business? They can figure that out. Um, not, you know, it's not easy to do, but it can be done. Frequently, people forget about the other part of the equation, which is what am I being asked to pay for this business, uh, good or bad? And what really trips people up is that you can have a great business at a very high price and it turns into a poor investment because you paid too much, essentially. Our trees don't go to the sky. On the other hand, this is what really gets people a little crazed. You can have an absolutely piece of garbage business and if the price is low enough, and frequently they are, uh, you have an amazing investment return from that. So we try to capitalize on both those things in the portfolio, which is this is a multi-dimensional equation. And the job is not to say, is this good or bad? But what am I getting for what I am paying? So this chart is a variety, and I won't bore you with the technicality, but a bunch of different ways to think about how expensive or cheap the stock market for the S&P 500 in this case. And the, the fact is green means cheap, yellow means eh, orange means getting expensive, and red means bad. Uh, and bad means future returns do not look good. And you can see, pick your poison on this chart, but the S&P 500 today does not look good. Uh, and it's a really, really big challenge. And history is really clear, as is logic, which is if you pay too much for something, nothing good happens to you afterwards. And that's what we're worried about from, from other investors. We're not worried about it in our portfolio because we have tilted away from a lot of these things. And we own a lot of unbelievable stuff in the green side of the equation, I'm glad to say, and some yellow, I will admit to, um, because we think they're just good long-term investments. And we have some things that look a little like the S&P, but we tried to downplay that as much as we can. And the committee this morning had a really good conversation about that. If we go to the next slide. You might say, well, if the S&P is so bad, how can you have anything that's good? And the answer is the S&P is increasingly not the market. Uh, the S&P is becoming increasingly just a small number of very, very big companies, uh, Apple being the biggest, of course, Microsoft being quite large, and a whole host of others. And what we're trying to show you on this chart, and this is not the S&P, this is a subset of it called the Russell 1000 Growth Index. So these are just the more exciting tech and consumer growth names that you hear about all the time. And just to get into the weeds for one minute, the reason that index has become concentrated is because the size of a company in the index is based on how big it is. So as an Apple, which is more than a $2 trillion market calculation, has a very big weight in the index. Smaller companies, which are you know not as successful as Apple, really, have smaller weights in the index. So if you look at this line, this goes back to 1995, and it shows you the top two names in the index. That's the red and the green lines, basically. And you can see that the addition of those two is what you're looking at, which is the dark blue line at the top. 
And you can see the index back in the TMT bubble in the late 90s hit 15% in its top two names, which were General Electric and Microsoft. Uh, then it got to about 12%, 12, 13 years ago, which was Apple and Microsoft. It's still Apple and Microsoft today, but they're 24% of the index and rising. This is actually a bigger number than it is in here. So the thing you need to think about here is that two companies are 24% plus of this index. They're not quite as big as the S&P, but they're very big in the S&P as well. And this is the exact opposite of what an index is supposed to be, which is diversified. Um, and so this is a huge concern. So when you ask the question, how does the index differ from the market? It's this, which is it's top heavy weighted into some companies that are really great business group, but they're, they're increasingly looking like they're in that red zone, which means that they can continue to be successful and not go anywhere. And one more quick point on this. Note that Microsoft was in this group a, a long time ago. They didn't stay in this group the whole time. Microsoft stock basically spent 18 years going nowhere. Um, and that's what happens to even successful companies when the price gets too high. People don't really, they struggle with them. Like, how can that happen? Well, it did. And Microsoft only turned its act around about six years ago, five, six years ago, and became the darling it is today. So it's fascinating. I think one company can go through the exact same cycle we're talking about. And I hate to say it, I like Apple products personally. It's going to happen to Apple too. It's not going to be a great long-term stock. It can't be. It's too expensive. So go to the next slide. I'm sorry, hammer home this point. So this is the other side of the market. It's the place people don't generally like to be. It's home builders, it's banks, it's energy companies, it's cyclical businesses. It's all kinds of literally less exciting businesses, less dominant businesses in many cases. And this is the same exact measure. We didn't list the companies here, but we're looking here from the 1990s all the way through today, how concentrated is this index, which is the value index. And the answer is it's actually, for the most part, less concentrated than it's been over the last, you know, this is almost 30 years here. Um, so the market is not concentrating. Just a few large companies are leading the way. And this is a really big concern. So we, we don't like it because our index and we compare ourselves to something that's being driven by just a few companies that's not healthy, especially we don't want to own them. But we love it because this is our opportunity set, this very big, exciting opportunity set. And I will tell you, I think the next five to 10 years, it will be amongst the easiest times we've ever had in our careers to beat the S&P 500. It's going to be a very easy index to beat for our players. Which gets to our next slide, which is our strategy. Um, we like to stick with what's up this top point. Things with a high probability of success. So betting, for example, that an overvalued stock will become even more overvalued, otherwise known as the greater fool theory, is not a strategy that works over time. It always gets in the end. We like the other stuff, where we might do things that look a little bit um, disappointing in the short term, but we know that time always will, will help us out and will look very good in the long term. Second point, we use the scale, stability, and time horizon of this portfolio to do some things that are really, really unusual and atypical. We have some exciting things in this portfolio that are going on that are not fully in the prices yet, and we can't wait to see that. and can't wait to show you those returns down the road. And second thing, I will say, I sound like we're anti-index fund. We actually think index funds are the major are better than the vast majority of other investment get fund out there. The problem is today, the index funds are offering a very low value proposition. I'm not sure the rest of the asset management industry is that much better. But the fact is that the index is usually something we love. And we're, we'd love to get back to the day where we can love them again as much as we used to. But we'll get there someday. Unfortunately, it's going to take some pain to get there. And then last but not least, um, we do accept volatility. Um, we've had disappointing reports to you before. I hate to say it, but we're going to have disappointing ones again. But if we can keep cranking out top quartile and top decile returns, that outperform our benchmarks and outperform our spending rate plus CPI. Um, we are willing to suffer some egg on our face along the way, and, and that's fine by us. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back for uh, I think a few questions that we have lined up. Thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Um, I always feel like I learned something new about investing and how we're doing investing um, and how crucial is doing investing. Um, so to kind of kick off questions um, for people that may be tuning in for the first time um, or want to know a little bit more about who we are, um, who is Crucial Partners? How did you get connected to the Greater Milwaukee Foundation? Um, and uh, what kind of work do you guys do for us? Thank you, Paul. That's a great question. Um, so Crucial Partners, by the way, is a rebranded name. One was founded... Believe it or not, uh, 43 years ago at Colonial Consulting, a uh, reference to British naval war history. Um, I joined the firm in 1986. 
Uh, in 2020, we changed our name to Crucial Partners uh, for a host of reasons that you might be able to figure out. Um, and what we do is provide investment advice largely to endowments and foundations. So uh, we work with about 120 endowments, 120 clients, most of whom are endowments and foundations. They have about 28 billion in total capital. And the Greater Milwaukee Foundation joined us as a client actually more than 25 years ago um, because we do a lot in the community foundation field. And uh, the foundation came across us and we came across them back in the day. And it's been a wonderful partnership ever since. And so we're just really proud to be associated with a great foundation and a great city and a great region. Um, what we do for the foundation is um, it's very important. We um, are the advisors. So the foundation has a wonderful investment committee, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, I think, uh, which is in responsible for actually deciding on how the assets in, that you've entrusted with the foundation are in fact invested. Um, our job is to be unbiased advisors and to come in and you know, give the committee a lot of information uh, to, for them to consider. Uh, we always have an opinion, which I'm sure you noticed in these calls, but I really want to be clear, we do not make decisions on your behalf, on behalf of any of the foundation, the investment committee is charged with that. And it's, that's one of the places where it's just a great partnership and where it's much better to have uh, two heads doing the work as opposed to one. Um, so that's that's our role, basically. So uh, you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how the foundation's investment committee works? Who's on it? Um, you kind of mentioned their charge in brief. Um, and how did uh, you, with Crucial Partners and the um, committee, develop the investment philosophy? Um, so the investment committee, and I believe we have a slide that we brought up, um, is a group of, of basically folk, folks from your community uh, that generally have investment knowledge um, and have and are also leadership positions both in the community and within, their, within the foundation. And the committee um, basically consists of a group of people who volunteer their time, very importantly, uh, because they care about the community and they care about the foundation's impact on the community. And uh, the process and the way this works with developing philosophy is that, you know, we, again, we walk in and, and basically give them something to agree or disagree with. Because I think someplace you have to make a development at that time. And that philosophy of being long-term oriented concerned about the things we talked about in the, in the review earlier, comes from basically these decades of working together. And there has been change on the committee over time, but it's also structured in such a way to provide continuity of thought and continuity of philosophy. And that's basically how, how it comes together. Um, every quarter, the committee meets. Um, we were joking this morning that the book, I believe, that they received from us uh, totaled, I believe the number was 150 pages. And a joke was made about, you know, how many more pages can we get and do we get paid by the page at Crucial? Um, and just for fun. So long story short, this committee puts in a lot of time and energy and they ask a lot of good questions and they do make decisions uh, which have real impact and they take that very seriously. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I'll take the next question here. I was curious how the GMF's investment pool um, is different from other financial institution investment options uh, with endowment funds. Thanks. That's a great question too, Amanda. It's, it's, you know, it's very different. Um, one of the things I highlighted in the presentation, uh, first of all, just the focus on how we control risk through differentiated thought and diversity. Uh, I don't think that, that's unfortunately extremely unique uh, out there. Um, the other thing is unique is the foundation has access because of its size, its reputation, and its relationship with us, admittedly, to a lot of investment firms that are just not in the public domain. Uh, they're not easy to find. Uh, Crucial, by the way, has a 22-person investment team. Uh, I am chief investment officer, and we scour the planet, literally, to find what we think are the greatest investors we can find. And we bring them to the table, back to the question Kelly asked for the investment committee to think about, understand, study, question, and then change and make decisions based on that information. So I think that this portfolio really doesn't look like even remotely like the things you would find elsewhere. It's not top heavy with household names. It's not sitting in a lot of mutual funds that, that basically have very easy in and out. Uh, we're trying to do things that demand that everyone around the table be long-term oriented. And mutual funds are great vehicles, but they don't demand that everyone be long-term oriented. In fact, just the opposite. That's great, thank you. Thinking about how our investment pool is different than um, what, 
how did the foundation um, with your partnership um, decide on our spending policies? So that 4.75%, um, I know we've had questions from different stakeholders, um, our CAN members um, and other donors about why doesn't that change? It stays pretty steady. It's been steady since I think 2012 or so. Um, how how does that decision get made and why do we stay at that 4.75 presently? That's another great question. Um, so there's actually a formula that gets used. It, it, it's I want to be careful. The formulas don't necessarily mean scientific or accurate per se, but the formula is simple. So um, for funds that are here, with a purpose of being perpetual, the endowment oriented funds. Uh, there's a law, uh, the Uniform Prudent Management and Institutional Funds Act, which demands that the foundation, and by extension, the board and the investment committee do everything possible to preserve the long term value of their assets. So I bring that up because every year when we do the asset allocation review, crucial partners, one of our responsibilities is to provide advice on that, as I said, but also to provide forecasts. And we do a 10-year forecast for every asset class plus inflation. And then we roll those up and end up with essentially two numbers. One is, what do we think this portfolio is going to return over the next 10 years, net of investment fees? What do we think inflation is going to be over the next 10 years? And we subtract A from B, that's the formula. And we get to a number, which is the 475 or so. Um, now, the number does fluctuate a little bit from year to year because the forecast change. Um, with that said... Uh, one of the things that foundations like the Greater Milwaukee Foundation do put a lot of weight on is some stability in their spend rate. So having a volatile rate that moves around, particularly with Crucial's forecasts, which I would love to tell you that our forecasts are going to be right, but they're forecasts, so we know they will not be exactly right. So we're trying to weave and have a good balance in that regard, and that's where that rate comes from. Um, and it's also pretty consistent where you see other endowment foundations uh, doing. But it also is a tough bar to hit today, particularly with higher inflation. And that's why we're mystified by why people want to own expensive stocks and not cheap ones when they have a very hard target they have to hit. Which is why, again, I don't fall, I don't, I would sleep very badly at night if I own some of these other portfolios, but owning the Greater Milwaukee Foundations, I know I sleep well knowing we're going to achieve our goal. That's wonderful. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I was curious, you've touched on this a little bit um, in your presentation, but I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on really how the committee works to align uh, the GMF's investments with our REI North Star specifically. Um, I was wondering if you had any possible fun stories or uh, tales about your work around the world, uh, you know, trying to recruit managers and how that plays into our policy. Yeah, I mean, the committee, um, so the person, they're not a rubber stamp. Um, you know, they have expectations. Uh, you, you, when you see the list, when you see, have you seen the list? These are, these are people who have been very successful in their careers and as investors. And, you know, they don't, um, they, I know I get sometimes nervous when I walk in the room with them because I know that, you know, these are really, really, really good people, really smart people. And you better be on your A game with them at all times. Um, so the way it works is two things happen at every meeting. We walk in sometimes with ideas that we think they should consider and give them these lengthy materials to support those ideas. And they say, why aren't we doing this? We should be thinking about this. Come back to us at the next meeting and we talk about those things. So it's a lot of give and take and back and forth. And frankly, one of the secrets to crucial success advising clients is we get to hang out with all these people. And trust me, we don't think of their requests or some kind of nuisance that we have to deal with. We learn from what they're worried about, and we try to translate that knowledge across our client base and, and do that in a bilateral way. Um, so that's how we do it. And everything, though, at the end of the day, comes back to the, the North Star again, which is, are we doing things that are consistent with the foundation's values, with its mission? And are we, are, by the way, are we ensuring that we're not doing things that would run counter to that? There are certain types of investing that we would deem predatory, for example, or that just that create and profit from marginalized communities. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the investments we make and that if there's a systemic or systematic uh, aspect of those investments that seems predatory to us, that's a problem. And it's, and it's frankly, I, I like to think that we don't bring those to the table because we know exactly what the committee is going to do with that. Uh, but I also think we don't bring to the table because we also disagree with the idea of investing in a way that's antithetical to your values. As we showed you earlier, you don't need to make a choice here. It's not do bad things in profit or else. Um, you can do good things in profit too. Like that, that's very much in our wheelhouse and the foundation's most importantly. 
I, I can tell you fun stories about traveling in the world if you'd like, but I, I don't know if you want me to or not. <laughs> you're you're welcome to at you you are so all over the place and I'm so grateful that you could take some time today um to meet with us um with that in mind um we had talked uh you had attended one of our community advisor and ambassador networks earlier this year um so uh, one of the things that came up in that meeting um and that we've also kind of seen from other donors um, other philanthropic leaders across the state um, is related to that mission-related investing, um, and then specifically into that ESG investing. Um, so could you talk more about that, about how um, those things, why is it a hot topic? What are, why are we hearing so much about it? Yeah. Well, you're hearing about it for a lot, so it's a fascinating topic, and it obviously ties into a little bit what I was saying before about investing in a way that you're considering the things that you're doing and the impact they may or may not have. Um, it's a hot, excuse me, it's a hot topic today for a couple of reasons. One of which is um, a good thing, which is there's just more information out there and people are you know, trying to capture the information and use it to think about what they're doing to a larger extent. The second is a bad thing, which is that it's become a bit of a, not a bit of, it's become a marketing pitch for the asset management industry uh, and therefore has led to a lot of controversy about higher fees, around you know what kind of values are being expressed on some of these discussions. Um, and it's a very complicated topic. So there's no changing any of those things. Uh, the good news is that there are ways, and these are things that the investment committee and crucial, and I think at you know, not too distant future, I hope uh, donors and fund holders will also be able to see we're we're upping our game as well in this area with some data-driven issues that are around. Um, climate change, diversity, equity, inclusion, and energy transition. Uh, and just the purpose, not to say we're going to do something radically different than before, but instead to have more data and more insights in the portfolio than we've had before. And so we've been on a very big process here, crucial, which um, we're dangerously close to showing the world. Uh, so very excited about it. So it's going to be, it's always been a factor in our thinking. It's just going to become I think, a much more robust one and a much more rigorous one than in the past. That's really exciting to hear. And I, I know yeah, that we've had a lot of people, um, like I said, from our CAN group, especially that are on pins and needles waiting for that information um, and for for that to kind of come to fruition with Crucial and um, hopefully with the foundation as well. And I will say, Kelly, this is a preview. Um, ESG is a complicated topic. And if you want to do it right, which by the way, just be clear what we mean by right, Right means with knowledge and with better, not worse returns. You want to do those things. You have to embrace the complexity of it, which mm -hmm. means that there are no easy answers. Uh, it, this is going to create, it's going to probably create more confusion initially than it creates assets, but it's going to be worth it in the end. Uh, so that's just a, just a warning. <laughs> yes, it's for lack of a better word. We're, we're still excited. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad I am too. Well, great, Mike. I've got one final question for you. Uh, so I, I work with a lot of nonprofits throughout the community that um, have their endowment funds held here at the foundation. Um, and, you know, obviously it's, it's been a turbulent year or, you know, over a year here. I was wondering if you just kind of had uh, any words of wisdom or advice that we could share with our nonprofit partners, um, you know, kind of forecasting uh, the years ahead. Yes. Um, so very simply put, um, you know, buckle up. Um, that's unfortunately the way things are, and they're probably going to stay this way. But also go back, and that's why I made a big deal before about that three-year number. Um, just remember that the things that are in front of us, while very disturbing, it feels like on a daily basis, um, capital markets have their own thing going on. And frequently when you know it's darkest before the dawn a little bit uh, is, I think, important. Um, that point I made earlier about um, Apple and other stocks that are very expensive and too optimistically priced and you don't do so well with them and the bad things you can do better on, that applies universally. So I would just say this, that uh, you know, for everyone who's on pins and needles, I totally get it. We are too. But try to remember that kind of the worse it feels, sometimes the better your returns are and then vice versa. And hopefully that gives you the, you know, the kind of the fortitude to just stick it, hang in there and, and let let time be your friend at the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, let diversification be your friend. At the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, let a really strong investment committee and hopefully a pretty good advisor you know, do their thing and, and generate those returns for you. We're not going to do it consistently. We're going to make we're going to make you sad sometimes, but in the end, we're going to get there and we're going to get it right. And and that's because we 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 do know 
how to make this work over the long term. So I just encourage everyone to try to remember that. It's, it's hard to do. I totally get it. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for your time um, and for your presentation as always. I uh, really appreciate you uh, you sharing your insights and your updates. Um, look forward to chatting with you next time. Great. My pleasure. Great to see everyone again. Thank you. Great to okay. see you. Take care. Well, thank you again to, to Kelly and Mike for generously dedicating your time and attention uh, for today's briefing. Uh, we truly value your insights and contributions um, and your presence as always greatly enriches our discussion. I'd like, like to take a moment just to inform you that our next quarterly investor briefing will be following a similar format. Uh, we believe that this structure really allows us for effective communication and collaboration and enables us to continue fostering strong partnerships with all of our stakeholders. Furthermore, I'm thrilled to announce that later in June, we'll be launching our new donor portal. Please keep an eye out for any future updates and instructions on the new and improved portal. If you have any questions that came up from today's briefing, I really encourage you to reach out to your relationship manager at the foundation. As always, our team is committed to providing prompt assistance and addressing any inquiries you might have, ensuring that your experience with us remains exceptional. Lastly, we want to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all of our donors for your unwavering partnership and support. With your investments to and through the foundation, you're all instrumental in propelling us towards building a Milwaukee for all and we're deeply grateful for your continued trust. With seven months left in the Greater Together campaign, we invite you to join us by starting or growing a fund, co-investing in our priority funds, or establishing a legacy promise with the foundation. If you have any questions about how you can get involved with the Greater Together campaign, please don't hesitate to contact your philanthropic advisor. Thanks again and take care.